Good day, everyone. I'm Kevin Kajiwara in New York City, and thank you for joining today for the 100th episode of Teneo Insights. David Petraeus is with me today. He's a partner at the global investment firm KKR, where he's also the chairman of the KKR Global Institute. He served as the director of the Central Intelligence Agency during the first Obama administration, and before that served 37 years in the U.S. military, known particularly for his command of the surge in Iraq, command of U.S. Central Command, and command of coalition forces in Afghanistan. Today, in addition to his role at KKR, he sits on a number of boards and is affiliated with a number of universities and think tanks. And he's also the co-author of a new book, Conflict, The Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine, along with the noted British historian Andrew Roberts. It's out now from the Harper imprint of Harper Collins. And on a personal note, let me just say, sir, that it's a uh, it's a pleasure to have you on this milestone 100th episode, as you're someone I've I've learned from in every conversation we've had, and I've been fortunate for your support for many years now. So, General Petraeus, thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's great to be with you, Kevin. Uh, delighted to celebrate the hundredth uh, episode of this podcast, and also, frankly, at, at over ten years that uh, KKR and Teneo have been associated. Uh, we've drawn a lot on you all over the years. Um, enjoy the analysis that you do, um, share that, and so forth. So, uh, again, really a pleasure to be with you. Really appreciate it. Um, I want to start with the some of the key takeaways from the book, if we might, because what's interesting about this book, if many of us have read all the time, you know, the histories, the political history, the sort of sociological history. Uh, behind a lot of the conflicts that we've experienced over the last 20 years with this or last you know half century but this book really focuses on many of the military uh takeaways and it it, it is a it goes into extraordinary detail um to i think come to a very simple conclusion which is again that you know those who ignore history are ever destined to to repeat it, unfortunately, and a lot of people die in the um, uh, in, in the ensuing wars. And what I thought was fascinating as well was how much you learned and others in the military learned from what you would think of as the, kind of the small wars, actually things like the Falklands or the invasion of Grenada, uh, as an example. And you go on at some length about how the the Yom Kippur War. Uh, was in for a long time the most studied war by the U.S. military because of this country surrounded by larger military forces fending them off in an almost Shakespearean kind of a way. So I guess I would ask maybe to start with your kind of bottom line takeaways that people should take from from the book. Well, the biggest is the importance of strategic leadership. And as you'll recall, in the introduction, we lay out essentially the intellectual construct that I used actually as a strategic leader. In fact, I developed it between the three and four star tours uh, in Iraq. But first, let me just underscore something that you highlighted, which is what the book is. Um, it is a it, it intends to establish the military historical context for the war in Ukraine. And now to be sure for the war in Gaza as well, which will be in the, the second edition uh, that we'll be writing here uh, over the course of the next few months and probably release this summer or early fall. Um, indeed, that was what Andrew Roberts uh, asked me if I'd be willing to be part of um, when the Russians invaded Ukraine. And I jumped at the chance in particular because I wanted to capture the military history that I'd experienced uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course, you'll have noted that those chapters were in the first person. I drafted them yeah. and certainly back and forth a great deal with Andrew and the editor. Uh, but the editor said, this just doesn't work as a third person. You know, you were there as a two star, three star, four star, four star and CIA director uh, throughout this entire period. Um, just go ahead and do it in the first person. And I've been eager to do that somewhere, but not doing a memoir or a tell-all or, or something like that. And also to revisit uh, the war in Vietnam, which was the subject of my PhD dissertation. But at the 10-year mark after we have many decades since then, uh, and the additional scholarship, the additional memoirs, the, the papers that have been declassified and so forth were very, very illuminating. I came to 
much stronger convictions about the fact that the strategic leadership there basically failed uh, until late 1968. And, and we can talk about that a bit further. But the real takeaway is, again, the importance of strategic leadership. We describe the tasks of a strategic leader as four. Uh, it first and foremost, and most importantly, is to get the big ideas right, to craft the right strategy, to have a really nuanced understanding of what the war is and isn't, of your forces, the enemy forces, the physical terrain, the human terrain, all aspects of the country in, in, in a very granular way, which frankly we didn't have when we invaded Iraq, I should note, um, it, it, have a sense of the neighborhood, all the factors that come to bear. And again, to then craft the right approach, the right strategy. In fact, we quote Clausewitz and at the beginning of one of the chapters that the first, the foremost, the most important task of a of a commander is to understand the war in which he is engaging and not make it into what he'd like it to be rather than what it really is. Uh, so again, getting the big ideas right is absolutely crucial. Uh, and if the strategic leader does not, if he doesn't craft the right strategy, uh, then you end up like the French at Dien Bien Phu, the Americans at least through again late 1968, uh, even the Americans uh, for a period of time in Afghanistan and for a period of time in Iraq. Uh, you know, we didn't get it right, then we had it right, then it was invalidated, then we had to do the surge in Iraq uh, and so forth. So uh, that is the be all and the end all. Then having gotten the big ideas right, having crafted a strategy, the strategic leader together with his staff has to communicate the big ideas effectively throughout the breadth and depth of the organization and everyone who has a stake in the outcome of the conflict, which includes West Wing of the White House, number 10 Downing Street, the Pentagon, all of our coalition partners, the host nation leadership, America's mothers and fathers, and, and so on and so forth. The third task is to oversee the implementation of the big ideas. This is what we normally think of as leadership. It's the example the leader provides, the inspiration, uh, the energy uh, that he or she imparts. It's how the leader spends his or her time. That's crucial. We called it a battle rhythm, and we had great detail. It's a huge butcher block piece of paper that showed what I would do every single day of the week, several times a week, twice a week, once a week, every other week, monthly, quarterly, uh, because that's how you drive the execution of a campaign plan. It's the meetings you do. It's what you see for yourself. Uh, it's the video conferences with the president of the United States once a week, meeting with the prime minister of Iraq once a week, their national security council, ours, and, and on and on, all of this, and going out and seeing it for yourself. We would go on patrol a minimum of twice a week. Uh, with soldiers outside the wire under body armor and Kevlar and so forth to get a sense for what it was uh, that they were experiencing. It's also the metrics, and they have to be really rigorous, ratchet them down. We spent a great deal of time getting the metrics right, in fact, uh, in, during the surge in Iraq very early on, and I presented those to Congress each time uh, I testified. And of course, they showed over time, over 18 months of the surge, uh, driving violence down by nearly 90%. It was irrefutable at that point in time. Uh, it's also attracting the best and brightest, keeping them as long as you can, helping them even after they leave, um, developing them, and it's allowing those not measure enough to move on to something else. And then finally, it's the organizational architecture that the strategic leader and his or her staff develop uh, to enable you to, you to command and control uh, this, this execution of the strategy uh, that was crafted as task one. And then there's a fourth task that is very important as well. Uh, and that is to determine how the big ideas, the strategy needs to change, needs to be adapted, refined as the situation changes, as you experience setbacks or experience success, achieve success. So that construct, by the way, all leaders perform these four tasks. The difference for a strategic leader uh, is that he or she is the one who gets this strategy ideally gets the big ideas right, crafts it, performs the others, because everyone else is operating within the decisions of the strategic leader. And if the strategic leader at the top, uh, say of the US effort in Vietnam, um, decides to embark on a war of attrition uh, against an enemy that you just couldn't succeed in that regard and pursues search and destroy the operations that have very ephemeral uh, uh, outcome uh, and use fairly indiscriminate uh, air power or indirect fire, mad minutes, all of this, 
uh, that often create more bad guys than they take off the streets uh, and don't really secure the people, then uh, again, the rest of that force is going to execute this, even though some of them uh, knew that it was not right. In fact, uh, exemplary in the U.S. forces were the efforts of the Marines uh, who had the CAP program. They actually broke down into small units, lived with the people, conducted what really was required, which was a comprehensive civil military counterinsurgency campaign, even though the strategic leader, successive strategic leaders, didn't actually like what they were doing uh, and wanted them to form up big units and go into air assault operations, tramping around in the jungle, again, with fairly ephemeral effect. Yes, maybe killing 10 of them for every one of us, uh, but as... Uh, one of the books I cited, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, is the author who is in the Idrang Valley, the first big battle, seen as a great success. And as he reflected on it, though, and I'd, I'd read that book when I was an air assault battalion commander, and I read it for the combat scenes and the leadership and the tactics and techniques. I really didn't look at his reflections on the overall strategy until this time. And as I read that, reread the book uh, and focused on his assessment that you know, those at the very top thought this is a real success, uh, killing 10 of them for every one American. But there were a lot of Americans killed, uh, and he wasn't sure that America's mothers and fathers agreed with that particular assessment. And, of course, he was absolutely right. So you you return time and again in the book to this construct of the four essential tasks of, of leadership, and you set out, like you say— very importantly, that that for the strategic leader, that grasp of the strategic situation, quoting von Clausewitz on that, I mean, this is not a new concept, but that if you get that one wrong, there's going to be a cascading problem then throughout all, all the. So I, I wonder if you can, and it does seem like to some degree, perhaps one of the high watermarks in the post-war uh, era of this was perhaps the George H.W. leadership, Bush leadership through the first Gulf War. Very much. Sure. Um, but yep. how how about the conflicts that we're looking at today and some of the leadership that sure. we're seeing, yep. you know, yep. in, in the Ukrainian and Gazan theaters and uh and, and the like? How would you how would you kind of score? Well, that's that? a those are some big questions, but let me <laughs> take them in in in, in turn. Um, first of all, you're exactly right. George H. W. Bush um got the big ideas right at the very top. And again, that's what the senior leader, the most senior leader, the president, prime minister, whatever, Prime Minister Thatcher in the Falklands. Um, but, you know, his big idea seems pretty obvious and simple with hindsight. It was not at the time. He sat down at the first meeting that he convened of the National Security Council. All of the uh, minister, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the uh, Secretary of State and others. And he essentially says this will not stand about uh, Iraq's invasion and occupation of Kuwait. That's a pretty big idea. The military uh, was fairly ambivalent about this. Of course, we didn't have forces on the ground uh, out in that region. Uh, we weren't sure whether the Saudis would accept us or not, how that would work out. I mean, there were a lot of unknowns. And the military was still quite burdened, frankly, by the uh, lessons of Vietnam, not all of which were perhaps as correct as the general sentiment held. Um, and was not eager. You know, the, the, the fact is that the most reluctant warriors sitting at the table of the West Wing uh, usually are those in uniform. And, and in the decades after Vietnam, that was particularly pronounced. Uh, but he got that big idea right. And then a combination of General Powell, the chairman, and General Schwarzkopf, the battlefield, the overarching theater of war commander, crafted the right strategy. The truth is that was a war sent from central casting for the United States. So, you know, there's just no country that's going to stand up to the U.S. Army, a U.S. Army led coalition uh, in the desert with no civilians on the battlefield, basically, other than perhaps in Kuwait City and so forth. But again, it, it in where the U.S. has air supremacy uh, could pound them for 43 days or so prior to a ground invasion that succeeded in, in 100 hours. Um, and by the way, you know, they built a force that was capable and, and seemed to be enough uh, to, to accomplish the mission. And then they just doubled it. They added an entire additional U.S. Army Corps to the one that was already uh, deployed. Um, but at the end of the day, very, very impressive strategic leadership there. And frankly, by the way, in the other uh, major operation carried out by the George H.W. Bush administration, uh, which was the invasion uh, of Panama. Now, we should also note, though, that it was in the Bush administration uh, that the initial deployment of forces in Somalia was conducted. 
during that time, it was really just a peacekeeping humanitarian assistance, keep the Somalis from starving. But of course, it then evolved into something uh, quite different uh, over time. And the big ideas then uh, really were not right, although it, that, again, falls uh, much more to President Clinton and then the leadership at that time. So it, again, you see it, I think, really at its finest in that regard. I, I'd also just note that there were some other particularly powerful big ideas during that time as well, um, as the uh, Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain all collapsed, uh, the Soviet Union was dissolved, uh, and the various approaches to German reunification and so forth. It was really quite a talented and uh, national security team. President Bush um, if you and Secretary turn... Baker both saying, oh. do not dance on that grave. And uh, Exactly. Uh, all right. of it. Yeah, it was yeah, really yeah. quite quite masterful. And again, yeah. you had Bob Gates as the Deputy National Security Advisor to uh, General Brent Scowcroft. Uh, that was the first uh, Condi Rice uh, tour in the White House and so forth. So again, an, an extraordinary team uh, across the board. Now, if you turn to Ukraine, it's very interesting to compare and contrast the strategic leadership at the very top of uh, President Zelensky and also of President Putin, because in many respects, Zelensky, close to pitch perfect, uh, certainly for, for the bulk of the time so far, uh, although there are some polit there's political intrigue below the surface and this kind of thing without question. But if you think, what was his first big idea? Uh, it was, I don't want to ride, I want ammunition. Um, right. Then it was, I'm staying in Kiev. My family's going to stay here. We're going to fight for Kiev. Uh, we're going to fight for our war of independence. All males are going to stay uh, in Ukraine and, and so forth and so on. Um, and by and large, quite extraordinary. Uh, and his communication skills are, of course, just close to epic. After all, he is an actor or was an actor. He was a comedian who played the president so humorously and effectively on TV that he actually got elected president. And his messages to all the different audiences, to his own people uh, each night, to the various parliaments and Bundestag and Joint House of Congress, both houses of Congress, the first wartime leader to do that uh, since Winston Churchill, I might add. In fact, he has been described as Churchill with an iPhone. Um, so the communication, very, very impressive. Then, of course, his oversight, you know, he takes off a suit, puts on a uniform, the example uh, that that he sends the energy, the inspiration, going to the front line, seeing it for himself, how he spends his time, all that. And I've met with him, by the way. Uh, I've been I was out there twice in the last probably ten months now, nine months, and I'll go again in, a, in another few weeks. Um, but all of these really quite impressive. And then periodically they're refining the big ideas and doing it again and again and again. Um, the challenge here uh, is that even though Putin has done it fairly miserable job, at least certainly for the first year or more. Uh, he overestimated his forces' capabilities. He underestimated the Ukrainians. He probably underestimated the U.S.-led uh, coalition response, uh, NATO response. He underestimated that Finland and Sweden would uh, embark on a path to NATO, and they're, of course, now both joined uh, NATO. So, you know, you could say that he set out to make Russia great again. What he's really done is make NATO great again. Uh, his example, you know, sitting at the end of a long table, browbeating his subordinates, he occasionally goes somewhere near the front, but not often, uh, doesn't really talk much about the war uh, at home um, and and so forth. But the problem here is that there is also an objective reality in which strategic leadership is exercised. And that reality in this case is that Russia has over three times the population of Ukraine, um, it is still able to generate forces. In fact, it has very high re, uh, enlistment bonuses, high death uh, uh, payouts, and all the rest of this. The salaries are artificially uh, inflated and so forth. Um, and he has put the country in a wartime footing. He has been able to generate additional combat power. Yes, he's lost more tanks than he had actually in service at the beginning of the entire invasion, but he had more in mothballs that he could bring back. They're not the top of the line, but again, uh, they're, they're still reasonably effective for the kind of war that he's carrying out, which is just very, very artillery, uh, missile, rocket, uh, firepower intensive. You basically destroy an area, and then when the enemy departs, you, you move into it, uh, and you push them out. And sadly, um, after suffering a number of reverses uh, in the first year, losing the Battle of Kiev, 
uh, Sumi, Chernihiv, Kharkiv, Kherson, west of the Dnipro, um, and in a modest amount during the uh, counteroffensive by Ukraine last summer that just didn't achieve what uh, everyone had, had hoped it would. And despite though suffering the losses at uh, in the Black Sea, where they've lost over a third uh, of their fleet, and they can't replace them because you can't the uh, the uh, Montreux Montreux Convention prohibits warships going through the Bosphorus right. at a time of war, something that Turkey enforces. Um, but the fact is, again, this objective reality is making itself felt now. Uh, especially as, frankly, the U.S. delays its uh, additional support for Ukraine, even as you see Europe stepping up very much. In fact, I was at the Munich Security Conference, and one of my colleagues here characterized it as uh, completely different from any he's ever been to. And, I, and yeah. I've been to a lot as well. I first went as a speechwriter to the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe back in the uh, late 1980s. Uh, in this case, normally it's the U.S. We're very serious. We're trying to get the U Europeans to step up to the plate. This time, the Europeans have stepped up to the plate. Um, Germany, you know, has increased its defense spending. They committed to get to 2% of GDP as NATO countries are supposed to. 18 of now 32, or perhaps 19 of 32, uh, will actually do that as well. Uh, and so they were serious this time, and it was the, the U.S. That, that appeared not quite so serious, uh, as it was unclear whether the House of Representatives. And if you really think about the way forward for Ukraine, people ask me, whither Ukraine? The only answer you can give is it depends, and it depends first and foremost on continued U.S. assistance. No one has the industrial strength capacity we do, even though the Europeans have already given two for every dollar that we have with another $50 billion, uh, just pledged. Um, but beyond that, Ukraine has to come to grips with its conscription issues, the policies yeah. that they have. They're very different from ours. The soldiers I was privileged to command, uh, the units, typically the age in combat was 18 to 23. Uh, in Ukraine, the average age of someone on the front lines is 42, uh, and they haven't rotated. So they've got, they're going to have to lower the age of conscription. That's very emotional there. They have to come to grips with this. This is one where um, President Zelensky has to refine the big ideas uh, on forced generation. This really is a political issue, not a military one. And then beyond that, it depends on each side getting to certain technology first. Don't count out the Ukrainian military industrial complex. It's very impressive. It was the, one of the major locations within the Soviet Union. In fact, when I first visited there, it was still uh, a Soviet republic. Um, and then a handful of other uh, factors, such as whether Europe and the U.S. can actually figure out how to give uh, a lot of the $300 billion in foreign reserves to, to Ukraine now, rather than just the interest on that, which is what's agreed right now. So a lot of this is about resources, and it's about force generation. And that is indeed what is going to determine the way forward, noting that this year is going to be a very tough one, I think, for the Ukrainians uh, until they can get some of the additional capabilities coming online, such as the F-16s and, and others. So I, I want to um, turn to Gaza here in a couple of minutes, but I want to sure. ask you a, a few very specific questions about and unpack a little bit about what you just yep. said there. It, it, you know, you made this point about how Zelensky has been basically pitch perfect in terms of his communication, but I do wonder if on that that we the collective we were sort of too optimistic going into 2023 and part of that was uh an overestimation of what would be accomplished in the in the vaunted counteroffensive and the like I, I wonder are we being too pessimistic going yeah, there's into a lot of people that characterize it that way I mean a lot of folks say we we're too optimistic we're in the beginning I forget there's a, a a phrase for each of these years but certainly yeah. last year it was too optimistic this year, it's too pessimistic. I think there's something to that. You can understand why it didn't happen last summer. Uh, basically, they didn't have the capabilities that we'd hoped they would have. The M1 tanks didn't arrive uh, in time, and the, the delay in the decision on M1 tanks and a variety of other systems meant that the Germans didn't provide the, the release of the Leopards that other countries, and they wanted to provide uh, to Ukraine. So they didn't really have much time with those in their arsenal. Uh, they also didn't have the breaching capabilities that they really need. And above all, they didn't have the air power that's required. Our doctrine says that to breach the kind of very formidable defenses that the Russians established, and we should give them credit for that. They did. That is learning, as they're also learning now with uh, the use of drones and missiles, many of them from, from Iran. Now, glide bombs is the latest innovation that they're doing. And, of course, getting ammunition from Korea and so forth. 
um, the, the you need air superiority, actually, not just air parity. Um, and they didn't even have really much use of air at all. In fact, at that time, neither side was making much use of air because of the lethality of the shoulder launched and then the more capable uh, vehicle uh, launched uh, air defense and, and counter ballistic missile defenses. Um, and there's a variety of other items that were delayed. I, it, so the listeners, I am non-political. I stopped voting uh, when I was a, promoted to two stars, I have not resumed. So I'm not representing or, or advocating either party's views. I'm trying to be as objective as I can. I think the U.S. led response initially was very impressive. And I think Putin underestimated that, probably influenced a bit by our uh, inability to stay in Afghanistan and, and the way that the withdrawal went. You know, the fact that we couldn't keep 3,500 troops on the ground, having not had a soldier lost in 18 months, and the cost was very modest uh, compared to, a, at that time, seven. Not to trivialize, but that was a defense. manageable situation. It, yeah, it was it was it was frustrating. It was maddening. Uh, it was undesirable, but it was just so much better than the very likely alternative. I mean, a number of I certainly on on air said many weeks before the the withdrawal that I feared a collapse of the Afghan security forces uh, when they realized that no one was coming to the rescue. The linchpin of that whole defense strategy was the helicopters and fixed wing aircraft that we provided them. We insisted on buying uh, American, something I held off while I was the commander. Um, and then it, that saddled them with very sophisticated, very capable aircraft, but they couldn't maintain them without the 17,000 contractors that were there to help them maintain those and a, and a variety of the other systems we provided as well. And the minute their readiness declined and degraded, and they were confronted with several different battles at one time, they couldn't respond with the very capable 35,000 strong commando force. So the big idea of the overall defense was invalidated. Um, so, but again, I think that was interpreted to a degree by Putin as a sign that we probably wouldn't be all that uh, all that substantial in our response. We were, I think that the administration deserves credit for that. But then also uh, comes in for criticism on delaying far too long, very critical decisions about key weapon systems that yeah. the Ukrainians desperately needed and typically didn't get anywhere near as early uh, as they should have, whether it was the multiple launch rocket system, the longer range uh, missiles for that. We still haven't provided the Army tactical missile system, which would double the range of what it is we've provided uh, right now. Uh, Western aircraft, U.S. tanks, which freed up, freed the Germans to make the decision on their tanks and so on. And there's a host of these. Um, and it meant that the Ukrainians just didn't have what they really needed. Although seeing how formidable that defense was, I should note that uh, probably unlikely once we actually realized the depth of the minefields, the double density of the anti-personnel and uh, anti-tank mines, the challenges and the fact that on top of all of this, you have uh, drones, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance assets that are tied back to guns that can respond pretty quickly uh, again, the task looks very, very uh, difficult. They made ad adaptations to how they were doing it instead of mounted breaching, essentially infantry creeping their way through. It just wasn't enough to achieve the kind of breakthrough uh, that we all hoped for. And, and you're right that perhaps this year uh, there's over pessimism, but not if the U.S. doesn't come through and also not if the Ukrainians don't come to grips with the force generation issues that they have to resolve. Can I step back from this for just one one second and unpack something you just said? Because it is, you know, that you talked about this delay in some of these sophisticated weapons platforms that could have been um, difference making on the uh, on the battleground. And I wonder if, you know, one of the as, as you look at not just Russia, but you look at, say, China and how it regards um, American resolve um, and the like, it, it seems, you know, one of the takeaways has been that one could argue that the U.S., uh, while while Putin has been, it seems, pretty meticulous in not allowing a single bullet to fall onto NATO territory or kill a NATO military personnel and the like. But the other takeaway is, is that the U.S. does not want to go to war against a nuclear power and that we do not want and Western Europe does not want to introduce weapons platforms into the into the conflict that could be seen as escalatory, as we've seen Putin just as recently as his latest um, latest national speech, 
again introducing the 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 nuclear threat the ft releasing you know leaking the documents that showed that the nuclear threshold is a lot lower than it ever been fully released before where, where do you th talk a little bit about about this concept of sure. uh, uh, you know yep look i think it is very legitimate and right to be concerned about nuclear escalation uh, and the U.S. was concerned, a book out just out uh, this week by Jim Shudo uh, lays that out as well, that perhaps this was closer than might have been thought uh, at the time. But once I think China and India publicly, the leaders both said, don't even think this, regardless of all the nuclear saber rattling, I think just very, very unlikely uh, that it would happen. And I think we were overly self-deterred, uh, again, on a variety of these issues. Beyond yeah, that, again... Right. Most of the systems were provided are not the kind of provocative uh, systems. And, and Ukraine, I think, would have not used them on Russian soil. It's certainly using its own uh, indigenously developed drones and missiles and other systems and occasionally some special operations forces. Uh, but again, I think that, that we, again, self-deterred to a degree on some of these decisions. And you also raise another point that we do make in the book. And that is that what happens in one part of the world reverberates in others. And, you know, if you have a red line that is not a red line, if you don't stay in Afghanistan when all of your allies and partners want you to stay and they have twice as many troops or even more than that on the ground, uh, it's yeah. affordable in terms of blood and treasure, and you still pull out, that sends a message. Because keep in mind that deterrence is a function of two elements. Uh, potential adversaries assessment of your capabilities on the one hand, and you've constantly got to be updating those and, and improving their defenses and resilience and survivability, et cetera, et cetera, and perception of your willingness to employ those forces. Uh, and if you undermine the willingness perception, uh, then you obviously undermine deterrence. So again, we make that point uh, very clearly in the book because we think it's a, a particularly important one. Now, I promise we'll move to the Middle East here in a moment, but you make another important point in the book. Um, and and I know you've been now into Ukraine several several times. I wonder about this because uh, you talk about how Putin has made some miscalculations um, when he set out on this uh, on this particular mission. But you say in the book that while morale is impossible to quantify, it is essential to victory. And um, one of the big questions that everybody had, I think the United States included, was how much fight there was in the Ukrainians going into this. But as as Ukrainian soldiers on the front line endure, you know, the deprivations of uh, of additional ammunition and new weapons platforms and new, you know, uh, new recruits and, and, and the like, and they hear the politics in Washington about whether they're going to get further funding and, and further materiel coming their way. Do you find that sapping away at their morale? Uh, is it complicating recruitment capabilities in Ukraine? And at the same time, is it bolstering the morale and giving comfort and quarter to the Russian side? I I think that's generally correct. Uh, again, the mood at, at, at uh, Munich, and I've not been back to Ukraine since last fall, but it was already at a time when you could see that the counteroffensive yeah. uh, had not achieved what uh, everyone had hoped it would. Um, the mood, I heard President Zelensky speak there. I met with his national security advisor, heard from, they actually brought some folks back from the front lines and so forth. And the mood is is quite sober. Uh, there's a degree of worry and apprehension uh, about it, especially when it comes to the prospects for additional U.S. assistance. They were saying, for example, that soldiers in the front lines, because they have internet access, uh, they're actually literally checking on the status of the House of Representatives uh, and the additional aid. It's that it, all the way down at that level. Uh, it's a concern. So again, morale, and it's this is very intangible, and it's 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 again very hard to sort of measure this objectively, but it is seriously important. And if morale is eroded, you know that was essentially what happened to Afghanistan. And by the way, you raise a point. I think it was legitimate of the administration to to and others to see will the Ukrainians fight. I actually had a pretty good sense that they would. I'd actually challenged. Uh, parliament members uh, who were at Munich two years earlier, uh, right before the invasion, two years before this year. Uh, and, and I said, you know, the big question is, especially having had the experience of Afghanistan, are you going to fight? And I'm not talking about 
um, your soldiers, I'm talking about you and your sons and daughters, and they were very unequivocal in their commitment to this. And they have proven to be very steadfast in that regard. The challenge now is, though, that they have to come to grips with conscription. Uh, there were a lot of volunteers in the in the first year and so forth, but those have been in the line for a long time now. They don't have a unit rotation policy. Uh, it's They're struggling a bit to have you know, uh, individual replacements for the casualties and so on. And they have to come to grips with this. So they're going to have to lower the age of conscription, which, again, they just have a very different approach to it. They don't go after the 18 uh, to 21-year-olds. They go after those that are a good bit older and so that they can establish a family, get an education, all the rest of this. So at the age of 27, uh, they start to look at that. So this is a challenge for them. They, they do, again, have to resolve this. Uh, and it's the one issue, by the way, on which President Zelensky won't talk publicly. Uh, it's that sensitive, and the yeah. parliament has really struggled with it. So you know, a good point to raise. Uh, and And again, tough times, but still determined, I would also say. There's no question about that. Uh, and there's still no appetite to negotiate, noting, I was re recalled Churchill's uh, famous statement, I think it was one of his great quotes, that it's hard to negotiate with a lion when your head, head is in its mouth. Yeah. Um, and of course, Putin doesn't seem at all inclined to negotiate. I mean, he'll stoke thoughts about that just to try to divide the West and so forth and uh, give some ammunition to those that think you can end this through a negotiation when it's very clear that he does not intend to negotiate at this point, he has this strategic initiative, if you will. Uh, they're pushing uh, very, very costly gains, but they are they are making incremental gains. Um, and so tough year ahead, I think, for uh, Ukraine and, and unlikely that they're going to be able to mount the kind of offensive that we'd hoped, other than, again, the continued actions uh, on the Black Sea. Uh, and perhaps if they can manufacture this huge drone army that they're talking about, uh, noting once again the very impressive military industrial capabilities that they have. They're really good at manufacturing, at a variety of IT skills, and, and a host of other uh, capabilities that are very important to this effort. And unfortunately for them, still so dependent on what goes on in, in capitals uh, outside of the region. Um, you Especially point out Washington. in the book, there's an awful lot of ways to win a war, but running out of ammunition before the other guy does generally is not one of them. Yep, yep. And, you you know, you don't don't win wars by retreating, as Churchill right. observed also uh, after the, uh, the retreat from the mainland Europe uh, from Dunkirk uh, early on in World War II. So I saw you the other day at the Council on Foreign Relations, um, and uh, you said that the, um, the the situation in Gaza is quite simply the most complex military situation since World War II, and that you cannot shoot your way to victory here. Um, so, you know, I'm just wondering, and you and you also made the point, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces are a great military organization, but they have never experienced this. And I know your own experiences in, in Iraq, you've helped, tried to help inform them um, uh, on, on this to some degree, but talk about the state of this sure. conflict yep. right now. Yep. In fact, I was just there. Uh, I was over there for the INSS conference, and I, I met with uh, for nearly an hour with the Minister of Defense at his request, and also with his number two, and then with his essentially his director of policy as well. And, and they, this is the most fiendishly difficult urban setting since World War II, I, in, in certain ways even tougher than Mariupol or Way or some of these. Uh, you have an enemy who doesn't wear a uniform, who knows the terrain really, really well, the neighborhood. Uh, who uses civilians as human shields, is holding still well over 100 hostages, um, who has massive subterranean uh, capabilities, over 350 miles of tunnels and underground facilities of all different types, including essentially um, manufacturing facilities, uh, plants, uh, headquarters, and, and so on, um, and very densely populated with high rises. So again, much tougher than anything we encountered in Iraq, although the battles of Fallujah and Ramadi and Bakuba and Mosul and so forth were very, very tough. Uh, and we did learn how to do this. Um, and, and again, to be fair, you're right. The Israelis actually have never done this. They used to do, they've done a few punitive operations into Gaza at various times. They did some penetration into Lebanon, but it's decades since they did a serious operation like this. It would probably be southern Lebanon, but even there, it wasn't quite the same. 
um, because I think they're going to end up having to own this area, whether they like it or not. And let me correct you a little bit. I, you said you can't shoot your way out of this. Um, they do have to shoot their way out of this. I mean, they do. So the big ideas right now uh, are essentially threefold are the objectives. It's to destroy Hamas. Destruction in military doctrine terms means to render the enemy incapable of accomplishing his mission. So it's not every last one of them. It's not every single leader, but it's got to be the bulk of them. Um, and without reconstitution is something you got to keep your eye on, because how you prevent that is the most fiendishly difficult task of all of this once you have essentially achieved that first part of the definition of destruction. They want to dismantle the political wing of Hamas, very clearly have to do that, can never allow Hamas to uh, run a, a territory that is neighboring to them, especially after what happened uh, with the barbaric, unspeakable, and in, inhuman attacks of 10-7. Of By the way, keep in mind the trauma here for that country, for Israel, uh, the equivalent of for in our terms of what they sustained would be 42,000 yes. dead uh, and 7,000 taken hostage. And keep in mind, 9-11, we lost not quite 3,000 uh, people, civilians, uh, in those particular attacks. So very, very uh, extraordinary there. And not an um, existential threat to the United States. Very much, yeah. It, yeah. This, in this, again, I don't know that this was existential, but it is the most, the worst, most horrific day of their history. Right. Um, and it certainly has completely uh, transformed uh, the views on how they have to in ensure their security. And then the third objective, you got to get the hostages back. Now, number one and two are in some tension here, needless to say. Um, but as they go about this, I think there are some additional big ideas that need to be uh, added to the mix. Um, yeah. One one is um, that you not only have to clear, you have to hold these areas. Now, whether you do it with Israeli soldiers or, if you will, local partners or outside forces, however you do that, you have to keep the population separated from the bad guys. And they have destroyed Hamas in northern Gaza. But you can see efforts to reconstitute. And, and if you don't clear and hold, uh, literally create gated communities is what we did, say, in Fallujah, 12 or 13 of them, as I recall. And we had an entry control point to each neighborhood, um, told them, you know, in Florida, you have to pay a lot of money to get a gated community. We're providing it for free. And you have a biometric ID card. By the way, the Israelis using biometrics in really skillful ways. Extraordinary what they've done with all that footage that was provided of 10-7. Sure. Yeah. And they're, they have facial record. They can identify these individuals and all the rest of that. Very, very sophisticated. So, uh, again, clear, hold, and then build. Because they're not going to win hearts and minds here, I don't think. Uh, you know, this, unlike Fallujah, where... By the time we conducted the surge and conducted these urban operations to clear Al Qaeda from these neighborhoods, I think by and large the citizens were happy to see Al Qaeda leave and, and someone protect them and secure them and then rebuild their communities. That sentiment's not going to be here. There's huge support for Hamas, but you at least want to keep the civilians from actively opposing you. And the way you do that is by getting them back into their houses, such as they are. Um, restoring basic services, providing massive quantities of humanitarian assistance, making sure it doesn't fall into the hands of Hamas, which I think is doable, but it has to be done. Uh, and then rebuilding all of the damage and destruction uh, that has been uh, wrought during this particular campaign. Now, the challenge is um, that they also still have to get into Rafah. Uh, they do have to destroy Hamas. And again, the only way you're going to do that is by clearing and then holding to keep them from reconstituting and rebuilding. And so the obviously civilian life has to be kept to an loss of life has to be kept to an absolute minimum. My sense is they're doing much more of a focus on that than in the early days of the campaign when there were very large munitions used in some urban areas. <laughs> Again, targets that were underground. Yep. Told the people with text messages, with leaflets and everything else, get out of the area. But now they've got to get people back into the north. Um, and that's a real challenge, I think. And and they're they're trying to come to grips with that. And maybe you can clarify something for me that I just don't quite understand yet. So, you know, there's been much made in, in recent days um, and the president announced it in his State of the Union address last week 
uh, about the building of this um, floating pier or a temporary pier that would allow um, uh, supplies and humanitarian relief to enter into into Gaza. How does how do we construct that and secure that and allow for the distribution of aid then into Gaza? But how do you protect that entry point yep. without well, uh, boots on the happen. ground? And is there a slippery slope element that nobody's talking about here? Uh, well, there is. There's no question about the possibility of danger here. There's no question about, you know, our forces will be in greater risk in this, even if they don't put boots on the ground. But I think we can protect them. I think it's very possible to have the counter drone and counter rocket and the other systems that will all be in position to ensure their security. Although, again, no question, there could be casualties as a result of this. But this is basically a capability that's called JLOTS, Joint Logistics Over the Shore. We know how to do this. My understanding is uh, from talking with folks uh, in Israel is that there will be uh, a combination of Israeli defense forces, local partners, maybe contractors as well, and funding uh, possibly from some very wealthy uh, individuals uh, actually in the West Bank and then also perhaps in some of the Gulf states. Uh, the UAE might be uh, a part of this in some fashion. Uh, at least to contribute to it. I'm not sure they want to put boots on the ground. Uh, but again, I think that will be the way it would be done and that there will be a pier or floating uh, dock that our system will connect with that will be built from the shore uh, out again by either Israeli capabilities, contractors, local partners, uh, and, and so forth. And, and again, some of that funded as well by uh, high net worth individuals uh, including uh, Palestinians. Um, the problem is, of course, this is going to take a number of weeks. The ship has to get there. You've got to then put it all together. Uh, they're very good at this. This is a U.S. Army capability, interestingly, uh, even though it's at sea. Uh, and and again, then you've got to set up this entire supply chain, if you will, that will emanate from Cyprus. So you've got to fly the stuff in there, check it all, put it on ships, unload it, and so forth. And that's why people rightly note that the only way to get the really industrial strength is uh, ground operations, trucks, and so forth. But as long as that is not possible for a variety of reasons, then this is going to be, this will help, as does you know the, the airdrop effort, even though it's rightly characterized as a bit of a drop in the bucket. When you're putting 30, 40,000 uh, uh, items in, meals in, to an area that has, uh, again, uh, hundreds of thousands of people in, in that part in which they're dropping it. So, yep, there is risk. There is uh, there are plenty of challenges. Uh, there are challenges just doing this in peacetime, frankly. It's it's tricky, but I think we have the capability to do it. Uh, I agree with the, the policy, and I think the way they do it, there will not be boots on the ground uh, from the U.S. There will be boots on a pier um, floating, uh, again, part of the joint logistics over the shore system, but not actually uh, on the ground itself. That will be Israelis, host nation, or uh, uh, local partners, uh, and then uh, some contractors, perhaps. What's your What's your current take on the Iranian position here? Obviously, we've we've seen considerable um, uh, compromising of shipping through the Red Sea due to the uh, due to who who's he's taking shots. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on back and forth across the northern Israeli border with Hezbollah. Uh, we've seen action in Syria and in Iraq, obviously, but but at the same time, after five and a half months, some of the worst expectations of what Iran might do um, have not yet come to pass. But what's your what's your read on? Well, they, Iran? yeah, they have not come to pass because Iran does not want to get it, get into it directly with the United States. And that's why when our three soldiers were killed and we had the very substantial response uh, against these Iranian supported Shia militia. Uh, in Iraq and also in Syria, uh, the Quds Force leadership went into Baghdad and said, guys, stop. Um, you're going to precipitate something that is more than what we really need. Now, to be sure, uh, those attacks have already put the Iraqi government in a very difficult position. I met with the prime minister of Iraq at Munich, uh, as I do each year, uh, and he's under enormous pressure, as is the government, uh, about the presence of U.S. forces on their soil. They know they need them because we're helping them, again, prevent the Islamic State from reconstituting, something that they were able to do, allowed to do, uh, 
uh, when our combat forces left in late 2011. And then the Iraqi government took highly sectarian actions that led their security forces to have to focus on Sunni demonstrations instead of keeping an eye on the Islamic State. It reconstituted a few years later. There's the first ever Islamist extremist caliphate. We had to go back in and then help them and our Syrian Democratic Force partners uh, uh, defeat that, eliminate that caliphate, uh, although there are still remnants in the form of insurgent and terrorist elements uh, in Iraq. And, and our capabilities help them enormously uh, and have kept uh, that element from reconstituting. So they have to be very careful about this. Um, but clearly, the, the presence of the Americans is a very sensitive subject. The other reality is that, uh, you know, what has happened in the Middle East has had a very, very minimal effect on the global economy. Yes, the uh, disruption of freedom of navigation in the Red Sea has kept 60 percent of the traffic going through the Suez Canal, a big hit uh, to the Egyptian fiscal position. So it's, this is very tough for them. Um, but the fact that ships have to go 10 to 14 extra days, a little extra cost is not that significant to the global economy once it adjusts. The real issue would be if freedom of navigation from the Gulf uh, was to be disrupted, because then you're going to have the uh, natural gas and crude oil that's exported from the Gulf states, and by the way, from Iran, that fuels the global economy. Uh, and Iran actually doesn't want that to happen because they are exporting 1.7, 1.8 million barrels per day uh, from the Gulf. We're allowing them to do that for a variety of different reasons. We may see that uh, not after the election. But uh, again, that's why there's really been no major effect, uh, certainly not to energy markets. And again, other than the longer transit time and the ripple effects of that, uh, this has not been that significant. Um, beyond that, what you see um, with the Houthis is really, I think the Houthis showing themselves for the first time, you know, on the world stage or the regional stage. Uh, this is their Saladin moment, you know, going after the Crusaders or whatever it may be. Um, that yes, they're supported by the Iranians. Yes, they wouldn't have the capabilities that they, that they have if, uh, if not for the Iranians. I think that we can over time disrupt degrade and, and ultimately perhaps defeat this, but we're also going to have to do a much better job interdicting what's coming from Iran uh, to the Houthis, and then at some point probably have to go after the Houthi manufacturing capabilities uh, and so forth. And that's difficult for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is we get more into this. The other is that the legal authority that we're using, it, it, this cannot come under the authority to use military force, which is, of course, Sunni extremists, that Al-Qaeda and then sons and uh, grandsons of, and cousins of Al-Qaeda at this point in time, uh, including the Islamic State, um, this is a, against a, a Shia element that does not have full allegiance to the supreme leader because they're from a different uh, element of the, the Shia religion. Uh, right. And and again, this is their moment in the sun. Uh, so this is a tough one. Uh, it's the first, no kidding, real combat for our naval forces uh, since the end of World War II. And if yeah. you discount the tanker wars uh, in the Gulf, and I guess it was the, the 80s, um, which had, saw nothing like this. I mean, they're fending off significant attacks by anti-ship missiles. There was even a, a submarine drone or a, a submerged drone. There, was, there were lots of drones uh, coming at them and so on uh, and doing an impressive job. Uh, but again, it's going to take that kind of full court press uh, and probably a little bit more interpretation uh, of anticipatory self-defense, shall we say, uh, to enable those at sea and part of this coalition to, to deal with this. And then you have Hezbollah, uh, which is a very formidable force. In, at the start of this, it was believed to have about 150,000 uh, various uh, rockets and, and drones and missiles and so forth, some of which are quite long range and have large warheads and are reasonably precise. Um, with the Israelis all mobilized right now, again, they're fending this off. And it appears that Hezbollah is very much constraining itself. It's it, it's limiting its attacks generally to a certain area, roughly not too far from the border, although it's displaced tens of thousands of Israelis, just as you have more than tens of thousands uh, out of the south still. So 
very large displaced population, hundreds of thousands as a result. And then the Israelis are generally confining themselves. They're limiting their response as well, although they have gone after a couple of key leaders uh, at times uh, much more broadly. I think the, the, that Hezbollah remembers 2006 much more vividly than perhaps um, yeah. Yeah. The, some of the rest of us did. And, and you have to remember that we've reassessed uh, how much damage Israel did in 2006. Originally, the sense was that the Israeli Air Force overpromised and underdelivered. Um, we reassessed that when I was at U.S. Central Command a few years later, and we reassessed it again some years after that when I was the director of the CIA. And I don't think they want to visit that on their people uh, because, again, they their grip on those people is pretty substantial, but even they uh, can undermine the support that they have uh, if life just gets really, really miserable for them, as it could uh, if they really provoke the Israelis. And, and there's a big debate in Israel about how to deal with this, how to get the, uh, the Hezbollah forces north of the Latani River, which would take them out of range with the more common uh, rockets and so forth that are used. Uh, but that has not yet been resolved. And uh, there's a, a U.S. envoy out there, Amos Hochstein, uh, in fact, he met with the minister the day before I did uh, yeah. and so forth, but not clear that he's whether he'll be able to achieve uh, what the Israelis are really seeking in this regard uh, to change the nature of the uh, security situation there. So um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and uh, I appreciate your in indulging me here, but um, I wanted to ask perhaps two last uh, questions um, of you and acknowledging that none of these things are getting the, uh, the, the the all of the time that uh, that would justify them, but I want to pivot for just a moment to to China um, and to reconcile for me, if you could. You know, one of the questions that's come up is that over time, autocratic leaders, the quality of decision making declines as they eliminate all opposition. They're surrounded by yes men. In Putin's case, he went down into the bunker. You had to be at the end of the long table to talk to him, and then he makes a strategic error. But China had always seemed to kind of been able to thread that needle with the dynamism. The Chinese Communist Party is autocratic, but they have this renewal, 10-year renewal of the leadership and so on and so forth, consensual decision-making. Xi Jinping comes along and he wipes all of that off of the, uh, off of the table. But as a, as a military man, considering the risks in, the, uh, in, in East Asia and U.S. interests there, and specifically around the question of Taiwan, and we know can't deny the the greatest peacetime buildup of a military in, in history in, in China's case, it seems as though. You know, talk about your concerns and essential view of the China situation at the moment. Yeah, I think you've described this correctly. There is an unprecedented consolidation of power with President Xi in his third term uh, as the party leader. Again, keep in mind, that's the real power. If you're the party leader, you're going to be the president and the chairman of the military committee. Right. Mission. Um, and and then reflect on, again, the fact that it's all his people in the Politburo uh, Standing Committee, for example. Um, there are, There's none of the other factions represented at this point in time that used to exist as they went back and forth between the supporters of this uh, party leader and then that party leader. And there was, a, I think, a healthy intellectual tension between them uh, as the power was uh, transitioned every 10 years. Right. We're now obviously into the third uh, five year term, the prospect of more beyond that. Uh, again, those around him, uh, very, very much his guys. Uh, and you see also, as as Kevin Rudd, former Australian prime minister, now ambassador to the U.S., has described it, uh, that that he has taken uh, China politically and economically to the Marxist and Leninist left uh, and in foreign policy to the nationalist right. And yes, this is concerning. Um, and I would contend that it actually has been counterproductive, particularly in foreign policy, that wolf warrior diplomacy has you know, caused the European Union to put the investment agreement on, on the shelf. Um, it Economic coercion antagonized Australia. Uh, physical confrontation on the line of actual control three times, dozens of Indian soldiers killed. Uh, undermined the relationship with India. They had to respond. They've you know, taken over 100 very important applications, Chinese uh, applications off their cell phones and so forth and other measures, pushed them more into the quad. Um, the uh, altercations at sea, the confrontation 
uh, in the South China Sea and, and Yellow Sea and all that have in a way pushed countries, the Philippines, back into the U.S. fold and, and so forth. Um, but this continues. And the key is we have to ensure that the elements of deterrence are rock solid. And as I described them earlier, uh, these they're, they're two in number. The potential adversary's assessment of your capabilities on the one hand and your willingness to employ them on the other. Right. And we see a lot of efforts, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, to uh, harden our forces, bases, and go underground with headquarters and disperse more, uh, improve the defenses, uh, beginning the transition uh, to more modern forces as well in, in respects of transitioning very slowly, but from a very small number of very large platforms, which are incredibly capable, also incredibly expensive and heavily manned, you know, again, surface combatants, aircraft carriers, F-35s, main battle tanks, et cetera, to a massive number of much smaller unmanned systems that increasingly will not have a person in the loop. They won't be remotely piloted. They'll be algorithmically uh, piloted. And the person in the loop will be the person on the loop who actually designs the software and embeds the conditions and the tasks and so forth uh, that the machine has to meet uh, in order to carry out a specific action. Um, all of that, again, we have agency here. And this is where, again, we have to be conscious that what happens elsewhere in the world affects those perceptions. Um, there is a certain number uh, in, in, in Congress and elsewhere uh, that say that, well, we should be focusing exclusively on the Indo-Pacific. Um, that's what matters. Um, and anything that detracts from that uh, should be you know, curtailed or what have you, including, again, some use this to justify uh, their opposition or reservations about further assistance to, to Ukraine. And that's just wrong. Uh, again, if you can't even support Ukraine, who's fighting uh, an existential threat, uh, which is also the major threat of all of NATO, uh, it's very much in our cold, hard national security interest to do this. And also, for what it's worth, in the, the interest of our prosperity and so on, because we gain a great deal from being the later leader of NATO. If you can't do that, you're going to undermine the perception in Beijing of your will uh, your willingness to employ the forces that we have. So again, um, the key here is that just every morning when they wake up in Beijing and they look wistfully across the Taiwan Strait um, and just conclude not today. And that's what we have to do day after day. Noting, by the way, that we cannot decouple our economies. Uh, Janet Yellen and others have had that right. Yes, you can de-risk it in certain ways. Yes, for national security interests, there can be entities in which we will not invest. There will be technologies we shouldn't uh, share or invest in, human bi biotech, uh, quantum AI, uh, dual use technologies, uh, no selling of um, the high-end microchips, uh, no Huawei in our technology, et cetera, et cetera. But that's de-risking, it's not decoupling. We are hugely dependent on China, as is very well known in a variety of different uh, commodities, uh, processed uh, strategic minerals, uh, and so forth. Um, but by the way, they're also hugely dependent on us. They literally cannot feed their people or their livestock uh, if if they don't import what it is that we provide to enable them to do that. And we just need to keep this relationship uh, from declining further, put a floor on, as they say, guardrails, et cetera, which of course has been what the uh, administration has sought to do. Uh, and I think you've seen a bit of this, uh, especially since the meeting, the summit between President Xi and President Biden on the margins of the gathering last fall in San Francisco. Um, we've got to keep that going. We want to be very sure that the next time something happens, like when the drone floated over the United States and the hotline is picked up in, the, in Washington, that someone actually answers, as was not the case uh, during that particular mini crisis. So I think that's the nature of this relationship. Um, noting again, China is our number three trading partner, right behind our two continental uh, trading partners, Mexico and Canada, in that order. We need them in that regard. We need to cooperate in a variety of other areas wherever we can, whether it's uh, the environment, perhaps some issues involving the global economy, uh, and, and so forth. But we also then in this, what is described as severe competition, a relationship by Jake Sullivan, um, we have to ensure that again, there's no questioning the, the solidity 
if you will, of deterrence. So this concept of de-risking, I think is a good segue perhaps into my my last question for you, which is maybe to ask you to take off your military hat for a moment and put on your CIA hat plus your now corporate hat. And that is, you know, as American companies think about their supply chain, think about their markets, think about their access to capital, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you feel that, and I, and I contextualize this by not only did Vladimir Putin, but the U.S. intelligence community and the White House told corporate America what he was going to do in Ukraine. And yet in February of 2022, it was remarkable how large a subset of American corporations were caught uh, by surprise and did not have a plan in place for how to deal with what were going to ultimately become stranded assets or reputationally damaging operations still uh, in, in, in Russia, as, as an example. Do you feel, when you talk to corporate audiences and speak to CEOs and others, that, that they've got a, a realistic view of the way in which the world is kind of evolving with all of the complexities that you've just scratched the surface on over the course of our conversation today. Um, De-risking is kind of re-risking in a way. I mean, they've invested a lot less time understanding some of these other countries and markets, um, which are also in, in challenging areas um, and where China already is in many cases as well. So how do you, how do you assess the way they're looking at the world? I well, I, you, know, you, have, here, but, you obviously yeah. have to generalize here, and I would contend that there are some, I think, that actually have a pretty good perspective on this and work pretty hard. I mean, the single biggest job I have here at KKR as the chairman of the KKR Global Institute is actually co-chairing the China Risk Subcommittee. Yeah. Um, we believe you still should invest in China, but we have a very substantial playbook on this to make sure that we're doing it not just legally and keeping up with the latest additions to entity lists, the latest restrictions, the latest small garden and high fence areas. Uh, the latest dual use tech, whatever it may be. Um, and also, again, should accept some investment from China as well. But again, it's very clear how that has to be done. You want to invest not just, again, legally and appropriately, you want to invest responsibly. Uh, and that's what we're seeking to do. I should note, by the way, with respect to both Russia and Ukraine, we de-risked our entire portfolio back in 2014. And then we did it again about four or five months prior to the latest invasion. Uh, that doesn't mean that you, we had thousands of workers. We would never have invested in a company in Russia or in Ukraine, but there were thousands of workers of the, uh, you know, we own about 120 companies around the world. Those yeah. companies often own, one of them owns another 120. So it was not uncommon to find that there are individuals working remotely from Russia or Ukraine, given the IT skills, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is, how do you de-risk that? We did it in a whole variety of different ways. Uh, and then executed some of the contingency plans that we put in place for some of those, uh, for a very large number of, of those individuals in the wake of the invasion. Um, again, what you've got to do is, is really have a granular understanding of all the dynamics here. Uh, again, not just of what the latest legal initiatives are, or the latest policy initiatives, or the latest uh, procedural ones, you know, an outbound screening mechanism is gradually evolving, this kind of thing, in addition to the inbound uh, CFIUS process, uh, and then be responsible as well. But noting, uh, as again, Janet Yellen did, you cannot decouple from China. Uh, we are so heavily dependent. Now, we should be taking steps to reduce that dependency, certainly, and I think that's it's fair to say that that's being done. Uh, with a variety of the different major uh, items of uh, appropriations and authorizations uh, pursued in the last several years in particular. Um, but that will have to continue. But we also, have, again, we have to be careful um, not to compete so much to be overly tough that it actually undermines the economy uh, in ways that would be adverse and, and, and maybe not completely necessary. So again, there's a very careful balance here uh, we're together with a number of other uh, companies uh, engaging in trying to figure out where that balance is. You ask, you know, in general, are people, I don't, in general, I don't think so. Um, but that's why you have to have what we have, if you will, is we've built this capability up. Uh, we also then have partnerships with uh, groups like yours. Uh, so you have to have a wide net of, again, 
advice, monitoring, uh, weekly updates, uh, weekly comparisons of notes. And again, the diligence process for potential investments uh, in, in, in a, any country like this. It's not strictly China, by the way. There are others as well. Um, has to be part of this. And and frankly, that's what we do at the KKR Global Institute. I mean, there are many, many countries in which we will just not invest because the rule of law, the whatever it is, security, uh, integrity is not present. Um, and again, with respect to China, you have to, again, be very, very conscious uh, of all of the different evolving because they're evolving very, very rapidly. Uh, the involving uh, restrictions, concerns, legal limitations, policies, initiatives and so forth. Well, David Petraeus's newest book is Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to to Ukraine. I um I want to thank you for for taking so much time to to talk to me on this 100th episode. Um uh unfortunately, I only got to scratch the surface. I have like eight pages of questions here and we, I think we got through uh got through two. Um but I hope that um everybody uh learned a lot as I have uh again. So thank you very much. Uh great, for, great to be with you again, time. Kevin. Thank you. And finally today, um I I regret to reg uh, to report to all of you um the passing uh of longtime Taneo senior advisor, guest on this program. Uh, the former Prime Minister of Canada, Brian Mulroney, who passed away a week or so ago. Uh, he was a titan of Canadian politics, uh, a trusted advisor, uh, a mentor to many of my colleagues in Canada, uh, and one of the greatest storytellers we ever had on this program. So he will be uh, he will be missed. So thank you all for joining me. Uh, until next time, I'm Kevin Gajawara in New York. Have a great day.